morning because we're in for a treat. So please help me welcome to the podium our pastor who is continuing his birthday celebration for another awesome talk, friends, Reverend John Scott, the beloved. Morning, family. Morning, Reverend John. Welcome, 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 and welcome to those uh, that join us in consciousness and watch us on the World Wide Web. Can we um, all say together, the world is a better place because of my giving. The world is a better place because of my giving. You know, I've been thinking a lot about giving, of course, because I had a birthday, and life has given me so much, including the privilege and the pleasure of a family that's more family to me than even, I don't have a very big family, and so this is my family. This is, this is my, my home in more ways than you may imagine, and each one of you has a very dear place in my heart and in my consciousness and in my prayers. I, I just got a, 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 an email from a, a good friend whose house is always full of children. You know I have a special place in my heart for children as well. She lives in, in New Haven in Connecticut, um, near to where my sister-in-law lives. And she sent me this email. An older, tired-looking dog wandered into my yard. I could tell from his collar and well-fed belly that he had a home and was well taken care of. He calmly came over to me, and I gave him a few pats on his head, and he then followed me into my house. Slowly walked down the hall, curled up in the corner, and fell asleep. An hour later, he went to the door, and I let him out. The next day, he was back, greeted me in my yard, walked inside, and resumed his spot in the hall, and again slept for about an hour. This continued off and on for several weeks over the summer. And so curious, I pinned a note uh, to his collar, and I quote, I could and I would, sorry, I would like to find out who the owner of this wonderful dog is and ask if you are aware that almost every afternoon your dog comes to my house for a nap. The next day he arrived for his nap with a different note pinned to his collar. Quote, you have given him a great gift, allowing him to rest at your home. Thank you. You see? He lives in a house with six children, two under the age of three. He's trying to catch up on his sleep. Can I come with him tomorrow? <laughs> what a gift. So I've titled my, my encouragement this morning, The Art of Giving. And don't worry, I'm not going to be haranguing you all for money, at least not in my encouragement. So let me see a show of hands from those of you who really consider yourself to be a giving person. Let me see. Oh, quite a few, quite a few. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to give you your assignment right up front. Your assignment this week, should you decide to undertake it, is to say thank you. Here comes the big frog to swallow. I want you to say thank you to someone who has irked you or for whom you have had a feeling of negativity. <laughs> Big frog. It can be a partner, a parent, a child, a boss, a friend, a co-worker, or a neighbor. Now, you're not going to thank them for annoying you or for their hurt. You're going to find something genuinely good about them to thank them for. I once gave this assignment to someone who had come to me for counseling, and you would have thought that I had told her to go home and commit Harry Carry. She was, had a whole lot of beefs about her husband. Why should I say thank you to that old so-and-so, she asked. He should be thanking me for staying with him. So I said to her, so why have you stayed with him? Silence for a little while. And then she said, well, you know we say in Jamaica, not swap black dog for monkey, which means stick to the evils you know of. And so I prodded her, and she finally acknowledged, well, you know him have some him have some use. I said, give me an example. And he said, well, he's a good provider, and although him don't like to talk, at least it's a body in the house. I said, go home and thank him for that. 
Well, she called me a couple of days later to say it was one of the hardest things in her life to look past all the hurt and resentment and thank her partner. But she finally did it. And something amazing happened, my friends. And she couldn't believe it herself. He put down the sports section of the paper and looked at her, and they actually had a conversation. Instead of talking at each other, usually she did the talking, they actually exchanged ideas. So this week, I want you to find something to be grateful about. Because she said, I said, how did you feel? She said, I felt full. And I said to her, well, that may be the origin of the word fulfilled. Filled full of the satisfaction of knowing that you have been listened to and that you have listened to someone. So this week, find something to be grateful for in someone who has perhaps irked you or distressed you. And if you can't actually meet and talk with the person, do it in your mind. Talk to them as though they are sitting in front of you and thank them for what you have learned from them. Because everybody's in your life and you can learn something from them. This exercise, my friends, is one of the most healing activities that you could undertake. You'll be amazed. You see, when we hold negative feelings about others in our past, we carry them into our present and into our present relationships. So you have to get rid of the anger and pain before we can feel fulfilled. I had a wonderful experience in the University of the General Penitentiary on Tower Street in Kingston, which uh, Reverend Michael and I attend uh, regularly. Well, for this cohort that we're, we, uh, we are now in, Reverend Michael is unable to be there because he has a, a, another commitment. So I was doing the classes on my own, but there is a very bright young man who attended about three cohorts back, and he was so turned on by this process that he has taken on the, the job of rounding up the participants, encouraging them to come, and monitor, being kind of their monitor and their shepherd. So when, when we arrive at the prison, and now when I'm arriving for this cohort, the 20 of them are seated and ready when I get there. So I said to him about three classes ago, why don't you co-facilitate this, this class with me? Because I had the idea because Reverend Michael had asked him in the class that, that followed his graduation if he would be the keynote speaker at the next class. And he gave a talk which outlined, if he didn't use notes, outlined the entire 12-week program class by class, extrapolating learnings and highlights and peak experiences from each class. He was brilliant. Wouldn't you agree, Reverend Michael? It was amazing. So Reverend Michael said, look, this is wonderful. So this class now, I said to him, why don't you co-facilitate? He was quite astonished. He said, me? When? I said, well, when I'm sitting up there, you'll sit up there beside me, and, and you will co-facilitate. So his first co-facilitation was, was last Tuesday, and the topic was forgiveness, the gift of Forgiveness. Now, what we do in that class is we ask small groups to get together and discuss what they would tell their young son or their young daughter, seven years old, if that child came up to them and said, Daddy, what is forgiveness? So they have to come up with a definition of forgiveness. Well, my co-facilitator last week stood to give the exercise, and he said, Gentlemen, before I give you this exercise, I have a confession to make. So there is silence. He said, I am a recent convert to the concept of forgiveness. So there were people nodding their heads because I can tell you there were people in the class the week before though when we said next week we're going to be talking about forgiveness. One guy said, I'm not coming. I am not coming. Mark me absent from now because I cannot forgive the woman who put me in here. Well, he was at class because my co-facilitator went for him at his cell and said, you're coming. Your resistance means you need it more than anybody else in the class. So the class had all the participants. And my co-facilitator gave a brilliant class 
I, all I did was sat down there with God, having God bumps and trying not to cry. Uh, as you know, those of you who are fellow weepers in this congregation know that that's very easy to do when you're moved. And he was brilliant. And one of the things that he, he said, you know, we've been talking about giving the gift of forgiveness to others. What about when you need forgiveness from somebody else? We need to talk about that. And they had that discussion and came up with the, the con came to the conclusion that forgiveness is giving love for, in return for, the hurt that you have got. So for many of us, that's a big frog. And the other one is, which I find a lot in our parents, uh, a lot of parents, is the gift of praise. You know, I, I know one, I have a, a friend whose son came home and all ones except for one subject. And what did the parents say? What is this? A three? You know, in maths, instead of praising the other eight subjects that were brilliant, that that parent zeroed. We do that sometimes, don't we? We find the one thing that's wrong. I have another friend who will say, John, you look lovely. There's a lash on your collar. You know, always finding the one little thing to pick at. So praise is something that what you praise, you raise. And I want to just encourage you to give the gift of praise to your young people particularly, but to your friends, to your, your partners, your spouses, to your co-workers. Find something to lift up and praise them for. Be mindful then of how critical you're being all the time. And you know, it's really funny. When, we, uh, when we, we're usually more critical of the people closest to us, aren't we? I, my, my mother used to say to my father, Honey, if I were you, I wouldn't wear that tie. And he used to look at my brother, myself, and say, but she's not me. And she, you know, so I am wearing the tie, not her. But you know, we tell ourselves that we're doing it for their own good. And so find something to praise because it's very easy to find stuff to be critical of. The other thing that I have found with people and the business of giving is that they expect something back. You know, that kind of con conditional giving. And uh, people have said to me, you know, I give and I give and I give and I don't get anything back. And I, I say to myself, well, what's wrong with that? You know, it means that you are looking for a quid pro quo. You're looking to get back something. And it's a big one because eventually you begin thinking, am I getting back enough? And before you know it, you are feeling shortchanged and, and used and resentment sets in. So I'm not saying that we cannot enjoy what comes back to us and believe me, the law always gives us back. Press down, shaking together and running over. It multiplies what we, we give. Which brings me to, to, to an odd, an odd fan, thing that I have found. Um, it's, it's the other big thing about giving which people don't like to talk about, the giving of money. And you know, I was surprised to find that a lot of, a lot of times when we, uh, we look at the love offering on a Sunday and we're, you know, we're getting it ready for the bank, we find that quite a few people are, have been putting in empty envelopes in the love offering basket. Now, I know what I've been in a situation where I haven't had any money and I understand the embarrassment you don't want the people around you to know that you don't have any, so you know. I guess that's, that's the motivation. But friends, that's a very powerful thing that your message you're sending to the universe. Because you have just said, increase and multiply what I have in my hand. And if you have nothing in your hand, what you're telling the universe is, increase and multiply what I have, nothing. So, ten is not. I, it has happened, 10 knots is not. What has happened to me, what, what I have done, is when the basket passes me, if I don't have any money that time, I give generously all the time. So if I don't have money that Tuesday evening or that Sunday morning, I just put my hand over the basket and bless it. I bless it because it is other people whose substance that they have given. And in my blessing it, I increase and multiply it. So if you don't, if you don't have, don't put an empty envelope in the, in the basket. Do yourself a favor, give yourself the gift of abundance by blessing the basket as it passes you. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
thank you for the two people who clap. <laughs> the other gift that I want to talk about a little bit is the gift of time. And time is a commodity which we never seem to have enough of, eh? So it's very valuable. And I want you to think about how much time you are giving. It's a wonderful thing to give of your time to a friend. And sometimes it really uh, calls for sacrifice on your, path because we, uh, on your part because we are busy. And to have to go and sit with someone is, is just a tall order for us a lot of times. But you can give by giving in service to your church, to your community, to your country. Um, just as, a, as an interesting exercise, try reading a storybook to children at the children's hospital or visiting an old people's home and just reading a, a passage from the Bible to them. You'll be amazed how fulfilling it is when you give the gift of your time to others. And back to my uh, class at the, at, the, um, at the general penitentiary, we, we were talking about this and the whole, the whole gift of, of forgiveness and giving, giving love for hurt. And my co-facilitator said to the class, and you know there is something else that we can give. We can give the gift of listening. Nobody in the class listens. You know, I'm always having to say, one class, please, because you know you. We, we do it too, not just um, in that class. You're in a meeting and, you, and you, you're having a sideways conversation, a lateral conversation with someone. Then I, we have a ground rule. Anything said to the person beside you belongs to the whole class. And so he was saying, you know, when someone is speaking, it is, a, it is an absolutely awesome gift just to listen. Anybody have a friend who is that kind of friend who just listens deeply when you're speaking? A lot of times when we listen, before the person is finished, we're either giving them a solution. No, we guys do that a lot. You know, your, your, your partner comes home and says, uh, he or she wants to vent, and you say, well, you know, the way, the way to handle that is they didn't want you to give them a solution. They wanted you to just listen. And perhaps the next day you might say, I've been thinking about what you said yesterday. Ah, so they feel listened to. And I was wondering if you, th uh, you, if you would consider doing this or not doing this. But don't do it right on the, this, on the spur of the moment when they're talking. Just listen. Let them talk and, and, pour, and pour out what's in their hearts and what's in their minds and what they're feeling. It's a very big gift. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of, the great, of this great teaching, said, and I quote, in the midst of plenty, humanity lives in want because of fear. In the midst of plenty, humanity lives in want because of fear, because fear is a denial that the divine is the center and source of all good. We must do all in our power to overcome the fear. And that fear we have is not just of not having enough. That fear is, it, it, it pervades all kinds of, of aspects of our relationships. We're afraid that if we take off the masks, and be who we are and share our authenticity, the other person won't love us. We're afraid that if we speak our truth, if we live from, from what we really believe, people will think we're odd or eccentric or, or stupid. Um, that fear really prevents us from giving the gift of ourself to other people. And the gift of yourself is the greatest gift there is. So we have discussed the art of giving, of giving away thanks, of giving away praise, uh, of giving away time, of conscious giving of money. And all these, for me, come under the heading of giving love. Love is really the bottom line. Early New Thought author Tom Johnson, in his book Lessons from the Source, writes, and I quote, we often feel that because we love someone, that we now have the right to tell them what they're doing wrong. I usually give my, my young um, brides and grooms to be the joke of the young bride who was very, bride to be, who was very, very nervous about her wedding day. And so when they went for marriage counseling, 
pre-marriage counseling, the pastor said, it's okay, I'll give you a little technique for, for um, overcoming the nerves. He said, when you get to the, the entrance of the church, just look up the aisle, you know, and the aisle that you're going to be walking up in all your splendor and your beauty and your glory, and just focus on the aisle. You know, just, just keep your mind focused on that, that walk that you're going to make in such beauty. And then when you're coming up the aisle, lift your eyes and look at the altar. I'll be up there and the altar will be behind me. Just look at the altar and focus your attention on the altar. And then when you come to, um, to stop right in front of me, I'll announce the first hymn and you just focus on the hymn. So that's your little uh, mnemonic, the aisle, the altar, and then the first hymn. So she got to church, the church the evening of the wedding and she was a bundle of nerves, but she remembered what father had said and she stood at the door saying, I'll, I'll, and then the wedding march began and she said, altar, and this will be the hymn, I'll alter him, I'll alter him, I'll alter him. Don't try to alter him or her or them because we love them. And we tell ourselves it's because we want the best for them, you know. But love does not try to change anyone, my friends. Love gives the gift of allowing people to be who they are. And when you do this, you can watch people in front of you grow. You know, parents, you need to remind yourself that even the teenagers who, you know, I mean, they give you a lot of reason to, to really return to prayer. But just remind yourself that the same intelligence that governs everything, including your parenting, is at that, the center of that young, young person as well. You need to begin to say to them, I trust you to be responsible. I see in you the maturity and the, the goodness. Give them praise, give them the gift of allowing them to be themselves. Does that make sense? I think so. So giving is an outflow. It's about being a channel through which God blesses your world. There's an author called Susan Jeffers who wrote a book titled Feel the Fair and Do It Anyway. And she writes about giving the following, quote, giving is about letting go of our crouched withholding self and standing tall with outstretched arms. When we really feel the sense of abundance, we truly understand the saying, my cup runneth over. And that abundance is the abundance of love and the, the givingness of life. We stand, excuse me, we stand with outstretched arms and say to the universe, all that I am, all that I have, I give. Let us stand and stretch our arms out and say that. Let us stand. All that I am, all that I have, I give. My cup runneth over. And to your neighbor, say thank you for giving. Your cup of good now overflows. Thank you, thank you for giving. Your cup of good now overflows. Namaste. Thank you for giving. Your cup of good now overflows. Namaste. Thank you. You may sit. You may sit. You think you can be used up? You think you can use up the giving? No, the more you give, the more you're going to get from the universe. George Bernard Shaw summed it up beautifully like this, and I quote, This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clodder of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making me happy. I am of the opinion, says Shaw, that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch which I have to hold up for the moment and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations." End of quote. And friends, I want you to know that I really see our spiritual community as this splendid torch. And I see each of you as a point of light in the radiant truth that is awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence. This light is illumining our country and beyond our borders, the entire world. 
Let us let set the place ablaze by generously giving our thanks, our praise, our time, our substance, and our love. The world is a better place because of your giving. Namaste. Thank <laughs> you.